Um, so just as a quick overview today, um, we'll use, uh, we'll, we'll jump right into uh, now with the foundation of sort of the early um, history of organometallic chemistry and some of the accounting principles in terms of electron counting. Now we'll jump into um, structure bonding and ultimately into reactivity. So I think this is where things start to get um, uh, exciting, from, at least from my perspective. Um, let me go ahead and try to share my um, iPad screen. Okay, so the, the, the first thing I want to say is that um, I'll, I'll scroll through a bunch of material here. It's pretty, and, and I'll go through it quickly, and, and, and honestly, it's, it's pretty text intensive. So don't feel obligated to jot all of this down. A lot of this is summarized in, in handouts. So um, that, that we sent. So if, you know, um, I kind of like to have it all in one place. And so I'm not toggling between different screens. So that's why I'll just go through it like this. But uh, this, this available, or this information is, is available in the, in the handouts. And so um, don't, don't feel obliged to jot all this down. Uh, and some of this, I'll, I'll just sort of like summarize um, trends that are you know, readily available in any textbook or, or, or on the internet. So if you miss anything, because I'm going through quickly, then and um, you know, I think a lot of this will be review anyway, but I'll, I'll go through this quickly. Today, today's lecture in general, there's quite a bit of material to cover. Um, and so I, we have some built-in time at the beginning of the next class um, for, for any things that we don't get to um, today. But so um, I, I, I wanna start out um, before getting into some of the intricacies of structure and bonding, just with a, a, a general um, so, so just step back and take a 10,000 foot view of, of just um, the, the, the transition metal series in general and some of the key trends. You know, we've alluded to this before in terms of electron, electronegativity, um, uh, but, but um, you know, there, there are other pieces to this, to this puzzle. And I think having a general sense of these periodic trends, which, which of course we're very familiar from, from all the way back to GenCam, uh, in, in the context of the transition metals allows one to develop an intuition for structure and bonding, I think that is, that is important um, and hopefully something you get out of this, this class. Um, so in contrast to other parts of the periodic table that you're more familiar with, a lot of the trends in the transition um, series are not um, uh, continuous and, and we'll talk about reasons for, for why this is the case. Um, and so, it, in, in, as a general rule of thumb, I, 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 it's, it's most useful to think about um, particular sections of the, the, the series when making um, comparisons. So for example, um, a, a, a given row or a given, um, a given group. Um, and then another point um, that I think we've already gotten a flavor for in, in the class is that the trends when considering the elements in isolation in their metallic state is, is sometimes different than the trends when they're of these, these same metals when they're, they're um, in, in, in a complex. So, so one trend, and this really goes, I, I think this is sort of the other side of the coin when we talk about um, electronegativity is ionization potential. Um, and so um, the ionization potential potential is a is a direct reflection of the of of the um, um, d orbital energies. So by measuring ionization ionization potential, we can uh, we we can get a readout of what the d orbital energies are, uh, and um, the ionization potentials. Um, increase uh, left to right across the transition metal um, series. And, and so this uh, 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 has, has a number of consequences, but in, in essence means that in, uh, um, all, of the, all, all, all else being equal, it's easier to pull a transition, uh, an electron out of an early transition metal than a late transition metal. Um, and of course, this is, is what one would expect from looking at the um, electronegativity is the early transition metals being more electropositive in character. 
And, and so uh, you know, an, another way to restate what I just said is that the energies of orbitals of an electronegative atom are lower than the, the same orbitals of the less electronegative or more electropositive atom. So I realize I have to put these reminders to myself where I just completely blow, uh, uh, blow through, through, through things. Um, so if we, if we consider um, a specific example of, of what I just said, let's consider zirconium plus two. Uh, versus palladium plus two. And, 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 um, and think about which one is more easily oxidized. So is it easier to get from palladium, zirconium two to zirconium three or palladium two to palladium three? Then we'd probably all agree that zirconium two is easier to oxidize. And, and so uh, an equivalent ways to state that are that zirconium two uh, is more basic or more electron rich than, than is palladium two. So let me just summarize that. Now the trends um, in, for, for this particular metric of ionization potential, the trends up and down um, the, a, a given uh, column are, are, are more complex. Um, and, and so um, the, these, you know, it, 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 there, there's, there aren't clear trends other than to just say, you'd have to look at the individual column to, to make a, a, a statement. And, and so another consequence of, of all of uh, what I just said is that um, if, if we think about um, high oxidation state um, species, which we'll define as plus three or, or, or greater, and in the literature, sometimes people will, will use the term high valent, uh, which isn't strictly speaking the exact same as high oxidation state, but often they're used interchangeably, uh, high valent intermediate or high valent species. Uh, as uh, to mean high oxidation state. This is typically um, we, we already saw that this is uh, easier to in, in general to form high oxidation state species of the early transition metals. Um, also, if you go and can compare first row, second row, third row. In general, um, it's harder for the first row and um, easier for the third row. So for example, um, if we consider nickel plus four versus platinum plus four, um, and my Roman numerals are terrible here. Let me correct that. Uh, platinum plus four. Some of you may have already even encountered in your in your. In the context of your research is a, is a pyphilic um, Lewis acid. Uh, so so the, 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 these are, are, are is, a, is a fairly common oxidation state of platinum. And in contrast, plus four um, nickel is, is quite uncommon. And when, when you make a well-defined plus four um, nickel complex, then, then you, know, you publish a good paper um, in, in, in JAX or, or wherever else uh, in the modern literature. So, so there are examples of nickel plus four complexes, but they're, they're much more rare and they typically require special supporting. Ligands.
Okay, so this brings us to our our poll where we'll we'll poll your intuition about some of the trends that we will talk about subsequently. So atomic size, namely atomic size and uh, metal ligand bond strength. Um, so this one should have three questions, I think. So I'm just getting the, the hang of this. I think that I can, I guess I can watch progress as it's coming in, but I can't, I can't register a vote myself. Sorry, I ended it a little early because <laughs> I thought it would take 60 seconds again, but I guess not. Oh, oh, okay, okay, that's fine. Uh, do, uh, do you have the other questions in the poll, Van? Yeah, but just I can't one? put them all at once. Oh, so. I see, okay, okay. So let, let's talk about this one and then we'll go back to the next part of the poll then. Okay, so um, hopefully, so everyone can view the poll, poll results. Um, so the plurality of, 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 of responses were, were correct here. Um, and I, I think those who, who are thinking um, this answer of first row, uh, 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 first row, then second row, then third row are also not far off because this is what you, the trend that you encounter in the rest of the, the periodic table. Um, and so in the transition series, um, We have this trend that um, the second and third row are indeed um, typically larger than the first row, but between the two of them, there's there's um, not not much of a difference, and it's 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 column dependent. Um, and so in going first to second, this follows our, um, let me put this in two different colors, our standard intuition um, of, of, that, that we've developed from GenChem, which is that um, size tracks as you get to higher um, principal quantum number, of the valence orbitals. And then this trend breaks down as we as we move from the second to the third row. And, and what's changed um, is that now you have the this this F block. You have a presence of F orbitals and there's this phenomenon called lanthanide contraction. And, and there are, I think, two, two explanations here that, that you can consider. Um, and I, I won't go into too much detail, but, but just sort of the, the upshot is that the major effect is that um, as you continue to pack more and more um, uh, positive charge into the uh, nucleus as, as you go up in principal quantum, um, as, 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 um, as you go to higher uh, atomic number, um, then, then of course the charge, uh, uh, effective charge of the nucleus increases and, and um, the F orbitals, unlike the SP and D orbitals, are less effective at shielding the um, uh, effectively shielding the the other orbitals um, from from the positive charge it's building up in the nu nucleus. And so um, you have 
uh, less effective shielding than you would expect for the number of, of uh, the, the amount of positive charge that you have in, in the nucleus. And so that leads to this lanthanide contraction. There's another effect at play here, which is called the relativistic effect. I think this is believed to have a minor, a, a comparatively minor contribution, but essentially this is that um, as you get to um, higher and higher energy orbitals, now if, if, if you consider the particle, wave particle duality and consider the particle approximation, um, the, the, the electrons start to approach the speed of light and thus become, become heavier. Um, and so they're, they're not able to fill the same spatial, um, um, uh, this sort of uh, project out into space as effectively. Um, so again, I don't want to go too, too deep into the weeds uh, there, but I do want everyone to sort of understand and appreciate that, that, that general trend. Um, and then one more trend here is that uh, four complexes of, of group four to seven with the same charge and oxidation state, um, size decreases. Uh, left to right. And so this is just, again, reflect reflection of having more positive charge in the, in, in the nucleus for a given number of electrons, valence electron. Okay, now I think we can initiate part two and three of the poll. And so this asks you to consider the bond strength First, just thinking back to GenCam, no, no tricks here. Um, what is the strongest carbon halogen bond? And then the second asks you to make a similar prediction for the a given um, group of, of transition metal uh, carbon bonds. And, and I understand that this might make you unhappy because we're not specifying the um, hybridization of the carbon and all, lots of other caveats, but just as a first pass approximation, make your best guess. Okay, it looks like we have most people having responded. Okay, so now you can view the poll results. Everybody um, uh, got part one correct, 100%, very, 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 uh, very rare to get 100% in a poll, but that's, that's good, I guess, for a, a, a room full of uh, PhD chemists or aspiring PhD chemists. So indeed, um, the, Carbon fluorine bond is the strongest, and and this just reflects this general trend that um, in the main group, um, as you you know for for a given carbon X bond, as you go down the periodic table, um, it gets it gets uh, weaker and weaker, and if we go now to the um, this um, other question um, part two, which is uh, now we only have a plurality of people who. Um, got this correct. And some people are thinking that it should follow the trend in the main group. And some people think it should follow the opposite trend. And some people wanted to, uh, one person wanted to, to just split split the difference. Um, and, and so the plurality of, of, of voters were indeed correct here. So uh, well done to you, you 16. Um, bond strength. Um, Car carbon metal bond strength increases as you go down from um, row row one to row three. And I, I asked this as a two-part question to immediately draw your attention to the fact that the trend is opposite of, of what you see in, in the main group.
And, and the origin of this, I'll, I'll give a, a somewhat hand wavy um, explanation. And if anyone wants to discuss this further in gory detail, I'm happy to do so offline. Um, is believed to be better spatial overlap um, of the metal with ligand orbitals and in uh, this you, you could you can make argument that I'm just going to restate this in, in, in different language, but let me just phrase this differently. Uh, and, and the closer match of the energies of ligand orbitals with the metal. Can you speak a little bit as to why that is? Like what's, why is there better orbital overlap for a third row rather than first? Yeah, that's a good, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I think one, one explanation I've heard and, and you can, um, let me know if this resonates with with you or not. Is that um, in the, the 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 third row, the um, s and 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 p orbitals um, are are sort of um, um, more um, how do I how do I frame this more overlapping in space with the 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 the, the, the d orbitals, um, and so as you get to higher principal quantum number. Um, there is uh, sort of more defined projection into space that is distinct from the uh, the, the other orbitals of the of, of, at, at that principal quantum number. But that may also be by virtue of them being larger compared to first row. By virtue of them, like um, by virtue of the uh, s. Like, I don't quite understand what you're saying, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, basically it's sort of like, you know, all things project away from the um, nucleus uh, uh, so a, a, as a sphere. So a, as you get to higher principal quantum number, you have more surface area. So at, at small principal quantum number, you have a lot of orbitals that are all sort of occupying the same space. And as you get to larger principal quantum number, things can be in their own, sort of in their own, in their own, um, own space more more easily that uh, if that makes sense if if people are are um, are are curious about that then then you know we can send a separate e e email and some more information or, uh, links to, to provide um, further further info on that. Okay, now let's um, just very briefly touch on um, um, a, a some some terminology or sort of a, a, a theory that that I, I think is is useful in some contexts, um, and and that you will in, invariably hear during the course of your your career in chemistry, which is a hard soft acid base theory. Um, the upshot here is basically that um, uh, th that for a given uh, metal ligand combination, uh, things that are small and, and charge dense uh, form strong interactions and, and things that are big and charge diffuse form strong interactions. And things where, where you have a mismatch do not form strong um, in, in interaction. So um, the, uh, th 
things where, where you have a high charge density are called hard and things where you have low charge density are called are called um, soft. Um, and so a key um, uh, sort of pr principle here uh, is, is uh, in addition to atomic size is the polarizability of the orbitals um, um, involved. Um, and then in terms of how this relates to periodic trends, um, first row metals tend to be, as we saw, smaller and, and, and harder and second and third row metals uh, tend to be um, softer uh, and, and larger. And also um, metals that are engaging in, in, in metal metal multiple bonding have more, I think inherently more diffuse um, orbital character. Okay, so, so the, the, the most rudimentary way to think about um, um, uh, structure is, is um, so in, in direct analogy to what is covered in, in, um, in, in, in GenCam, which is uh, VSEPR uh, theory, valence shell electron pair propulsion, where for a given um, um, number of, a given coordination number, um, the, 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 if, if we think of each, um, uh, e each metal ligand bond as a, as, as a electron pair, uh, and then for a given coordination number, there are a certain number of privileged, uh, low energy configurations, uh, uh, uh geometries, uh, where these electron pairs are, 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 um, splayed out on, on a sphere essentially. And so, um, there's there's obviously more to it than this, but this is I think the place the place to um, to to start. And so, for uh, two two coordinate um, species, there there there's only uh, one uh, there there are only really two two choices. Um, this is uh, and so um, there's the linear linear form, and we see this a lot in um, gold one complexes. I think this should all be in your handout if you don't want to jot this down. As well as um, copper one, bent, bent form. So this is an, an analogy to water in the main group. Um, so tin, tin chloride, um, trigonal planar. So this is an analogous to like BF three in the main group. Um, For uh, organometallic complexes, pyramidal and T-shaped are somewhat less common. So we'll just call these specialized. And I'll give you one example of what I mean by this. So you don't encounter these every day. So um, here's an example of just, uh, and, and here's the accompanying reference, of a T-shaped complex um, just from the modern literature. This is uh, from, Pat Holland's group at Yale. Pat came out for a DLS lecture. I was, I was thinking about this. It's, it's now several several years ago, which is making me, reminding me of um, how long I've been here now. We see our, one of our favorite aerial groups here, DIP. And it's this um, nickel one carbonyl complex is, um, is actually T-shaped. And if anybody is um, quickly trying to do the oxidation state assignment and the electron count, this is nickel one, D9. Now the, the three that I've highlighted here in bold are those that we're gonna encounter most commonly in the class, square planar, tetrahedral and um, octahedral. Let's give some specific examples. So Wilkinson's catalyst, palladium tetracus, titanium, 
fluoride, iron carbonyl is an example of trigonal bipyramidal. So five coordinate um, is another important um, uh, coordination number, so we'll encounter um, this as well. So uh, when we get to ligand substitution, you'll appreciate that like if you lose a ligand from an octahedral complex, then you're, you're in that square pyramidal uh, territory. And then in terms of octahedral complexes, uh, we've already encountered these with uh, our discussion of Ferner complexes, and there are many others, molybdenum hexacarbonyl, for example, um, tungsten hexacarbonyl, one that our lab has, has used iron aqua complex, et cetera. But from this analysis alone, there are, 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 it's, it's evident that there are many properties of um, coordination complexes or transition metal complexes um, that, that are not directly addressed and there's not really a way to, to think about. So um, th those include the fact uh, that that some complexes are are, uh, are 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 magnetic and some some are not. That anyone who's worked with any of the complexes that we've discovered discussed so far in this class will appreciate that some of them are um, are, are brightly colored and, and there's no way within VSEPR framework to think about uh, color. And so, um, you know, for for many years, chemists wrestled with this question of how to develop a framework to actually think about um, electron pairing to think about um, being able to understand and predict color across a series of, of metal complexes. Um, and and um, one, one that has stood the, the, the test of time is, is, is crystal field theory. Um, and so I've just got some bullet points here sort of um, defining crystal field theory and, 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 and who developed it. So this came online in the, in the 30s and, and you'll recognize and appreciate that actually um, crystal field theory was in introduced before some of the milestones in organometallic chemistry that we covered um, um, er er uh, earlier in the, in the sort of historical overview part of the of the class. Um, and and the, the upshot, I think, I think this the statement I'll make next is a little bit unclear in isolation, but will become clear when when we jump into the details. Um, what 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 this uh, crystal field theory does is is um, think about how orbital degeneracies, particularly d orbital degeneracies, change as a function of an electric field um, that that is imposed by the the, the ligands that are being um, coordinated. And so this doesn't make any assumption about bonding interactions. It just treats the ligands as point charges in space and asks how do the different d orbitals uh, become higher or lower in energy as a function of moving these point charges closer uh, to to the nucleus. So in 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 this um, framework, and and I think this is hopefully obvious from the class in general, met metals by virtue of, of you know being um, um, uh, uh, in, in, in many cases, uh, 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 char form formally charged, and, um, and, and uh, in, in other cases, just just being um, um, uh, you know electro uh, electrophilic in, in character. Um, they, they serve the, the, the negative point charges are balanced by the positive charge on the metal, and this leads to attractive interaction uh, in terms of the uh, the the, the uh, sigma bonding. Uh, in, interaction, um, and so as the as the point charges approach the metal from infinity to being in bonding position, uh, now this uh, changes the electron uh, uh, energies of of some d orbitals more than others, um, and the d the orbitals that are more in the way as the point charge is being brought towards the nucleus. Uh, end up going to higher energy. Uh, and this is just like what happens when you bring two wrong ends of a magnet together, then, then you feel this 
uh, the, the, this uh, magnetic repulsion. It's sort of the same same principle. Um, and so the extent of 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 this the the splitting by splitting I just mean how how much um, some orbitals become higher energy compared to others is a function of oxidation state of the metal. So higher oxidation state um, leads to higher splitting. And the ligand identity, we'll talk about what this means, but higher field ligands lead to higher splitting energy. And then the geometry and coordination number, this will be something we talk about in detail. Um, so I, I've just gone ahead and drawn all the, the d orbitals. You don't, you don't need to do this. I always try to do this on my own time so you're not embarrassed. So I don't embarrass myself in front of, in front of the class. So what I mean by this ligand field theory, what happens, let's consider an octahedral ligand field. You have these six point charges and these approach the nucleus. I'm gonna undo all of these so I don't ruin my nice drawing. And now we're considering first the dz squared orbital. Um, as con by convention, we define the z axis as the axis that is the highest symmetry rotation axis uh, for that, uh, uh, for the uh, geometry that we're, we're talking about. So octahedral in this case, um, we define the Z axis as a C4 rotation axis. Um, and so in the octahedral ligand field, we have these six um, ligands that are, um, that are splayed out all along the X, Y, and Z axis, and they're approaching the metal. Now, if we consider the effect that these incoming point charges have on the DZ squared orbital, You'd imagine this would be quite pronounced because they're running directly into the dz squared orbital. Uh, likewise for the dz dx squared minus y squared orbital because the lobes of this orbital lie along the x and y axis. Um, and then if you consider the other 3d orbitals dxy, dyz, and dxz, um, it, they, they will be affected but they will be less affected because the point charges um, are not going to directly clash with any of those, um, uh, the, the lobes from those orbitals. Okay, so now let's consider um, an energy diagram for, for what I just described. So we first, we have our are 5D electrons and they're degenerate, meaning they have the same uh, uh, energy. Now, if we imagine hypothetically, what would, what would happen in a spherical Ligand's field? So, so not with this point charge treatment, but in a spherical field, all of these would be affected equally. They would all get to higher energy because of the field that's applied, but neither, none would be affected more than, than the other. Uh, and so, uh, so that's what's illustrated uh, in, in, in this part, just so, so everyone's um, oriented. Now, if we consider instead an octahedral ligand field, we just said that um, the dz squared and dx squared minus y squared are going to be. Um, brought to the highest energy. And that the other three will be less, less affected. They'll in fact be less affected than they would by a spherical ligand field. Um, so if this is confusing, just, just kind of think back to that more intuitive explanation I gave that as you bring these point charges close to the nucleus, some of the, uh, these orbitals are just gonna directly run into those point charges. And of course that is gonna 
lead to um, uh, higher energy. And it turns out that um, the overall energy, um, the, uh, the, the splitting energy is defined between as the difference between the, the, ener the orbitals that go to high energy and those that are, that are lower in energy. Uh, and the, the, in, these um, ligands are, are given a, a, a new, new name, uh, EG and T2G, which is, is just a symmetry descriptor. Um, And so our five d orbitals are now split in such a way that we have uh, the, the three T2G orbitals that are um, comparatively low in energy, and then the two higher uh, EG orbitals. And then for a given d electron count, we just go right through and, and fill them, fill these out. Uh, and so this is common for d0, d3, d5, and d6. I highlighted d6 here because this um, is, is something we already covered. Um, in, in the context of burner complexes. And if we just go ahead and fill these in then for a D6 metal, this is what that, that would look like. So um, all of the um, T2G orbitals are, are fully occupied um, and we have no unpaired electrons. Last time I taught, there's an interesting question about what actually the splitting energy corresponds to in terms of electron volts or, or, or kcals per mole. And so I've highlighted that here. You could actually, you could just do a back of the envelope calculation, thinking about the fact that these um, absorb in the visible range oftentimes, and and this um, uh, splitting energy corresponds directly to the absorption energy, and then back calculate that if, if you're interested in that exercise. Okay, so that's a. Um, octahedral field, and I discussed that in a fair amount of detail. The next ones I'll go through um, quickly because it's essentially the same framework applied again and again. Um, and so uh, in a tetrahedral uh, uh, li ligand field, um, the, uh, the, 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 there's a, in general, the splitting energy is lower than an octahedral ligand field because you don't get any of these sort of head-on collisions like you do in the octahedral ligand field. So that's why I've noted here that the overall um, splitting energy is, um, is is less than in the octahedral ligand field. Um, and then if you think about which of the orbitals are, are most and least effective, then, then um, you'll, you, you, you will eventually conclude that, that, um, that dz squared and dx squared minus y squared are, are, are less impacted by this, this um, uh, tetrahedral ligand field. Uh, this is common for D0, D5, D10 metals. Um, and the, um, uh, te tetrahedral ligands tend to be high spin. We'll, we'll talk about what that means, but uh, this is be, you know, the, the, the trade-off here is the energy required to pair two spins versus the energy required for placing an electron in the higher um, energy, energy orbital. And so uh, very quickly, square planar. Um, which is uh, common for D8 metals.
And then because typically the we have eight electrons, um, the four lower en low energy orbitals are are filled, and so the, the splitting energy is, is sort of is, is is defined as as the one highlighted. Okay, let's as you're sort of jotting down last notes and and uh, and and digesting that, let's jump over to problem of the day number one. So let me do a new share. So the first part of problem of the day number one is review and then the second part is um, uh, is is applying what we just covered. So you have two complexes A and B that are related to each other in the sense that A undergoes reductive elimination to, to make B. Um, and so first is just do our standard workflow from last class: coordination number D electron count geometry, metal oxidation state, total electron count, and then jot down the uh, d orbital diagrams uh, and then and then how the electrons will fill those d orbitals this is uh, uh we'll give 30, 30 seconds to think of it on your own and then uh, van do you want to enable breakout rooms so people can quickly compare answers before we discuss Uh, Yikun and Wereborn, I think you guys should go to room nine. You mean I hide? Yeah, I think I assigned you guys to room nine. So if you, is there an option to go to breakout room from your end? Oh, I don't see uh, options for breakout room. Oh, okay, let me. It seems that I can't I can't go into the breakup room. I just jump over, jump back. Oh, it just makes you come back. <laughs>
looks like people are starting to trickle back. You want to do a one minute warning or something, Van? Okay, I did it. Okay, it looks like almost everyone or almost everybody's back. So let's take a stab at this. Um, maybe we'll do it complex by complex. Um, Carter, do you wanna give A a shot? Sure. Um, I, I, a should be octahedral. Uh, with palladium for uh, D6 with a total electron count of 18. Okay, give me one minute to catch up. Are you, um, am I screen sharing my iPad now or am I? It's the paper. Yeah, okay, let me. Sorry, I gotta catch up to you all. Okay, here we go. Uh, just one more time, Carter, sorry. Uh, uh, octahedral for the geometry, uh, okay. palladium four for the oxidation state. Okay. Um, D6. Okay. And with a total electron count of 18. Okay. And then for octahedral, Ligand field, I would guess you drew something like this. And you said D6, so let's fill in the electrons. Is this what you got? Yeah. Perfect. Anybody get anything different? Questions, discussion? Okay, what about the same thing for complex B, June? Are you there? Uh, yes, so... Uh, palladium, palladium master here. So what, what do you think, June? Uh, so, um, so complex B, the correlation number is four. The D electron okay. count is 16. Geometry is square planar. The major oxidation state is number, uh, close to total electron count. Well, uh, the electron count is eight and the total electron count is 16. Yep. D8, 16 electrons. And then uh, conveniently, we have this square planar. Um, set here, so let's just fill this in rather than redraw it. And you got something that looks like this, June? Uh, oh, so, uh, excuse me. So, yes. Yeah. So I missed that. You said square planar for the geometry, is that right? Yeah. And then you had something that looks like this for the orbital diagram? Uh, square planar, not the same. Uh, I think square planars, you should have different uh, 
orbital diagram. So it would be like the one on the top, yeah, the top left one, or D8, yeah, just here. Right, right here, right. Sorry. Okay, let me. I think I'm. I think I'm confusing you. So let me. Let me just go back and. So. So you had something that looks like this. Is this right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any questions on that? We went through it a little bit quickly. I, I, again, I think it's one of these things where if it's if you haven't seen it before and it's confusing as you work through more examples, it will become a little bit more second nature. Personally, I find it a little bit difficult to know, like, you know, if, if you held a gun to my head and asked me to derive these particular um, orbital diagrams just from first principle, like visual inspection, it, it would be hard to do so, but once you just get in the habit of, of, of sort of knowing what or, um, what geometry corresponds to what orbital orbital diagram, it's easy to rationalize and understand. That becomes intuitive over over time. So if you're not, if you haven't seen this before, and it seems a little odd, this also brings us to our chemist of the day for today. Yeah, you you yes. have the the d x y orbital written twice for a square planar on the left side. Um, maybe you should. The bottom one should be. Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, yep. Let me just. I have missed. I must have uh, miss drawn this from my note. So the bottom one yep, should yeah. be. D. X. D. Thanks for catching that. Yeah. No problem. The, um, anybody recognize the chemist of the day? Oh, wait, Kiri, before we move on. Yeah. I just had a quick question. So for, for complex B, was there any evidence for some sort of coordination between uh, the palladium and the, uh, like the CF bond or? Um... Yeah, not, that's a good question, Carter. You could, you could imagine that. I, I mean, in, in general, fluoride, uh, uh, fluoride substituents are not particularly good Lewis bases, so they don't, th th there are cases where they can come back and form a sigma donating interaction in the metal, but but they also cannot do that. And I think in this case, they have a crystal structure of the product showing that it doesn't, doesn't do that. Um, if that was forming an, an, a, a bonding interaction, then, then you know, you could potentially assign this, if you drew that as a data of interaction, you could potentially assign this as an 18 electron complex. So if, that, if that's what you did and that was on your mind, then, then, then that's, you know, without further evidence that that would be a reasonable proposal. Uh, I was just curious, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Anyone want to take a stab at the chemist of the day? This look a bit weird, but my guess is Melanie Sample. Oh, that would be a younger, younger photo of Melanie Sanford, but you're 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 close. It's this this paper that I am referencing here is indeed a Sanford paper, but our chemist of the day is the first author from that, that paper, not not Melanie herself. So let me very quickly put up the reference here. This is from uh, Jax 2014. And this is a study of the factors that dictate whether CF reductive elimination from this palladium four high valent center is favored um, over CN reductive elimination. Um, interesting uh, sort of chemoselectivity challenge. Uh, and the, the first author was a, is a former postdoc from, from Melanie's group, uh, Monica 
Perez Temprano, uh, who uh, did her PhD at uh, the in in Spain at the University of uh, 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 Via uh, Dorid. And you can't judge me here for my bad pronunciation because I took like four years of, of Spanish. Uh, she did her BS and PhD at the same institution with uh, doing the latter with uh, Pablo uh, Espinet and uh, Juan Caceres and then postdoc with uh, Sanford at University of Michigan before in initiating her independent career at ICIQ as a group leader in 2015 and has done a lot of nice work um, in her independent career in, in, in cobalt chemistry of a similar flavor to, to this example actually, but but um, but focused on on uh, high oxidation state cobalt and um, and, and, and synthesizing um, intermediates relevant to CH activation. Okay, let's uh, continue charging forward. Um, we have a fair amount more material to cover, but as I said, we do have some time built in uh, for things we don't get to next class, so that's fine. Um, so I, I want to introduce now um, what's called the spectrochemical series. And this is a, a empirically derived, and I'll, and I'll just highlight this so that um, the point is, is clear. You know, this is something that um, you, it do, doesn't fall out of first principles. This is an empirical trend um, that 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 um, some um, that, that different ligands ligands end up having different uh, splitting energies associated with them, and some are high field and some are uh, low field. And so. Those on the right of this are, are high field ligands. And those on the left of this are low field ligands. And um, in general, some of the trends that are, are shared, and, and if this terminology is confusing, then we'll unpack what this means uh, uh, shortly. On the right side of this, the high field ligands include things that are, um, uh, uh, strong sigma donors as, as well as pi accepting ligands. Uh, and then on the left of this are, are ligands that are pi donating um, uh, uh, ligands. And so this is this just basically falls out. I mean, you can tell from the name spectrochemical series, this just falls out of spectrochemical measurements of a whole series of model complexes uh, over the course of many years uh, and, and, and um, measuring various absorption wavelengths, the function of the ligand coordination sphere and the metal, uh, and, then, and then deriving this as a general trend um, of, of how, how much of a splitting effect these different ligands have. So now let's go into another, um, I, I guess it could be viewed as a manifestation of of the spectrochemical series or, or of ligand field strength and another piece of terminology, which is uh, high spin versus low spin. Um, so let's um, illustrate this with an example. Um, and I've tried to draw this su suggestively. Um, so let's consider D5 octahedral iron three. So it's octahedral, so we've drawn the orbital diagram um, as we defined earlier. On the left is the high field case where the splitting energy is high. And on the right is the um, opposite case where the splitting energy is, is small. And then we said that um, Okay, so then now let's go and just um, fill, fill in our five electrons. Um, so let's see, Brendan, do you wanna tell us what will happen in these two scenarios? Um, so I guess you'll have, 
sorry, I'm not sure the difference between the delta high and delta small, and how, I'm not quite sure. Okay, well, let's like, fill let's let's fill in. Maybe this will be obvious. I think when we let's consider so yeah, the left case first. Sure. Let's so you have one first first three electrons, and then yeah, we so you have one more. one unpaired electron. Okay, so now here you have two two options. You could you could go to higher energy, the, the EG orbital or the T2G orbital. Um, and what I've tried to illustrate below here is that this ends up being essentially a oops, essentially a competition between these two principle, Alfbau's principle which is that lower energies should be filled completely before filling higher energy orbitals. And then Hun's rule, which is that if two or more orbitals of equal energy available electrons will occupy them singly before filling them in, in pairs. And so if this is high, I think you, 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 uh, you already said this, Brendan, but we'll, you would fill these two orbitals because filling the EG orbitals would be associated with, with what is we define as a high energy that would exceed the, the pairing energy. And you would be left with one unpaired electron. And, and then the opposite case would be this. Sure, okay, where, I see. Where, where we first fill these, what, what, what are higher energy, but, but similar energy level orbitals of the, of the EG. I got it. Okay. Thanks. And so this high splitting energy is what we would call um, then uh, would lead to a, a low spin configuration, whereas the low splitting energy would lead to high spin. And in terms of specific examples, we have here. And I'll note that the, the this spectrochemical series is that, that there are more ligands that fit on this than just those that I've I've highlighted. So if you see one that I don't have somewhere on this list, I just encourage you to consult your your notes for a more comprehensive listing. And so if we just look at bromide, for example, I don't think I have nitrate. Uh, nitrite on here, but um, if we consider bromide, this is on the extreme of a low delta li ligand. So this is gonna be low splitting energy. Um, and we're going to singly occupy all five of the uh, orbitals before doubly occupying any. And then terminology that you'll hear and in, in read in the literature is, is diamagnetic and, and paramagnetic. Paramagnetic species are those that have uh, unpaired electrons and diamagnetic species are those that have no unpaired electrons. And um, this often, when you're when you're doing syntheses of these complexes, this often manifests itself by by like when you make paramagnetic species, they're difficult to characterize using the techniques that us organic chemists like, like like um, nuclear magnetic resonance, for example, owing to their unpaired Curie, electrons. Could you? Kiri, could you, um, since you asked me this question, I guess I might as well follow up. Um, can you explain the, that seems amb ambiguous a little bit to me. I mean, obviously bromide is on the low side of the, the empirical sort of list you gave us, but how do you know when you're going to be off ball, when you're going to be Hun's rule, when it's going to be unpaired, when you're going to like, is that, did you just give two extremes or? Yeah, I think that there's, at the end of the day, there's no way to, to the, the, the only definitive way is to make the corresponding complex and then do a measurement to determine whether it's high spin or, or, or low spin. I think for a, a test or a homework, we'd try to ask you extreme cases, or if we asked you an ambiguous case, we'd, we'd, we'd ask you to reason through why it might be one or why it might, why it might be the other. Uh, so I, I wouldn't worry too much about that. I think, I think you know, we want you to understand the extremes and, and kind of how to think through it. Um, 
but but there's no way to derive from first principles whether something's going to be high spin or low spin. Okay, I see. So, so, so I think you know, like, I, lines, I, oh, yeah. Go ahead, Kelly. Sorry, Kelly. Um, are aqua complexes usually a mix of both high spin and low spin, or are they usually one or the other? That's good. You're foreshadowing our next problem of the day, Kelly. I don't know no. if you're knowingly knowingly doing so or. Why no, not? I'm not. <laughs> um, but oh, that, and that is the next thing that comes up. Okay, problem of the day no, no, number two. Uh, let, let's let's uh, let's come back to this question because this is at the heart of of this this problem actually. Um, so let me share this, read it out loud, share my screen. Okay, so everyone, whoops, that's the syllabus. Is everyone able to see this? So this one asks you to predict three, um, gives you three complexes and asks you to predict high spin or low spin. Uh, the first one, as Kelly foreshadowed, is a cobalt aqua complex. The, the middle is a, uh, uh, a tetra uh, cyano, uh, uh, um, nickel complex, and then the C is a hexafluoro cobalt um, complex, and and this is one of these cases that I think Brendan and Kelly were asking about, which which is, you know, you have let's say two of these are extreme cases where we'd expect you to be able to make a reasonable prediction. The other, you might make an argument could go either way, and 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 that's okay without more more data. So let's take 30 seconds to think about that and then we can just discuss it quickly. Okay, Jun Chen, do you wanna take a stab at, at this? Are you there? I'm here. So maybe let's so, first just define define the oxidation states in, involved here to get everybody and, and the electron count to get everybody oriented. So we have cobalt three plus, which is what? Um, it should be, it should be low spin. Oh, sorry, the, the electron count is D6. Okay, D6, uh, drawn as six coordinates, so octahedral D6, and you're saying this is um, low, low spin. Um, let's come back to this and, and, and maybe do the other cobalt one first, another cobalt three plus complex. Um, what did you get for C? That's another D6 octahedral, and then high spin or low spin? And this one may be high spin. Okay, and then the last one, let's go to the middle one, B. What's the uh, D electron count and did you design it as high spin or low spin? D7. And it should be low spin. Okay, so we have nickel plus two and that should be what? Uh, D7, right? Oh, sorry, D8. Okay. And it should be uh, low spin. Low, low spin, okay. Uh, so the, the two extremes are the uh, cyanide ligand and uh, which you, you, you identified as a, as a um, strong field ligand and the fluoride which you identified as a weak field ligand and then the intermediate one was the, the aqua complex. So what was your reasoning there, Jin Chen? Uh, I, actually, I don't know uh, 
I guess because the Cobalt Three is very, um, it, yeah, and the Flora is really prefers a high spin complex, and Cobalt is 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 really prefers the low spin complex, and water is not very a, a very high spin uh, ligand. So I guess overall it should be a low spin complex. Okay. It's kind of like if, if you meet it halfway, then, then, then it's a low spin. Yeah, this is one of these intermediate cases. Um, that I think if you draw the, the, the whole spectrochemical series, then you'll see water is, is maybe in the middle or a little bit to the, to the, to the right. So it's, it's a strong enough field in this case to make for a low spin um, complex. But this is a problem where if we asked it on an exam, we would maybe ask you to to weigh, weigh that your considerations uh, rather than giving an absolute prediction. Okay, any questions on that? Is this affected at all by the overall charge of the complex or is that insignificant? Yeah, that's right. It, it also um, is affected by the nature of the, the metal and the oxidation state of the metal as well. Um, so, in, in general, first row metals have this ability to be high spin or low spin that you typically don't see in second row or, or, or third row. And so um, the, the splitting energy doesn't just come from the ligand set, it also comes from the, the, the metal. Good question, Kelly. And, and again, I think that's just because as you go to second and third row metals now, you have higher energy orbitals in general. And so, so the... Um, 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 uh, the, uh, the 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 um, differences are more are more pronounced. Uh, okay, let me do a new. Okay, related to this discussion, a concept that I will introduce uh, briefly is uh, Jan, Jan Teller distortion. Um, and, and in terms of, in, you know, the consequence of Jan Teller distortion in, in, empirically is, is that in, in octahedral, in octahedral uh, metals with, with an unpaired, with, with unpaired spin, you often see elongation uh, along uh, of the, metal ligand bonds along one axis. And, and the underlying um, cause for that in, in, in terms of the, the electron configuration is that whenever you have a set of degenerate orbitals that are unequally occupied, there's this tendency for symmetry breaking. Um, and so you would go from what is high symmetry octahedral to a lower symmetry um, um, form, which is what would you call this? I guess um, square by pyramidal um, uh, ge geometry. Um, one of the TAs can correct me if I'm if I'm if I'm wrong. Um, but that's just so that you you know the here are the EG splits so that you have one orbital that's slightly lower in energy and one that's slightly higher in energy. So the overall uh, complex is, is is lower in energy. Okay, the last thing that I will um, in introduce with our remaining five minutes, and, and then we'll come back to some of the things we didn't, uh, didn't cover at the beginning of, of next class, is ligand field theory. Um, I, you know, I always debate each year whether we should cover this at all or not, and, and uh, it's not covered in the Hartwig textbook. It's covered only briefly in the Crabtree textbook, but I, I do think it's um, uh, important to, to know that it's out there, I think for our purposes in the class, crystal field theory will, will, will get us where we need to go the vast majority of the times. But I think it's important to understand that there is more complexity uh, and to also prime your mind to start thinking about how bonding in the transition metal series fits into this, this MO picture of organic molecules that you learn in, in undergraduate. Uh, and so ligand field theory is essentially the superposition of MO theory and crystal field theory. 
Um, and it was developed in the 1950s after um, uh, crystal field theory by Griffith and, and uh, Leslie Orgel. Um, and so the, the purpose here is to, to um, grapple with this reality that, that in fact ligands are not point charges operating in space and that there's a vast difference between a ligand like fluoride and a, a ligand like an alkene. Um, and and the, the way the d orbitals are affected when surrounded by a field of fluoride ligands versus alkene ligands is, 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 is very different. Uh, and that the, the d orbitals uh, raise and lower in energy in, in accordance of, of what the MO picture of the surrounding ligands looks like. Um, and so what I'll show you now is, uh, is, is hopefully to help you un understand this, but if it, if it seems like it's a little too fast and furious, then, then you know, don't, don't, don't panic. Um, so in, 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 in the first step, I think, in thinking about um, ligand field theory is to uh, uh, think about the um, what, what are called symmetry adapted linear combinations of the ligand orbitals. So we'll consider this case, which is the simplest case, which uh, is an octahedral um, set of ligands that are pure sigma donor donors and have no pi accepting um, um, uh, capabilities if that terminology is, is familiar to you. And if you draw out the symmetry adapted linear combinations of what six sigma donor ligands look like, you get to these um, depictions here, uh, and the, the symmetries are E, G, T, 1, U, and A, 1, G. And, and this is analogous to when you're building up um, uh, an MO diagram from a combination of atomic um, orbitals. So, so that's basically what we're doing here, just in thinking of each of the ligands as, as in essence, an atomic orbital, or um, at least a, a, a vibrational displacement vector. So, you know, I think this actually is pretty intuitive. If you just, if you look at this, these, uh, these, these salks, and then think about like what d orbital would, would a given salk like to interact with? So the A1G, you see that it's all one phase and might interact nicely with an orbital of S symmetry. It, the T1U, you think, you know, it has this one node and looks like it might interact nicely with a P orbital. And then the EG, you look at and you think, hmm, that might interact nicely with like the one on the left with the, the, the D squared orbital, uh, the DZ squared orbital and the one on the right with the DX squared minus Y squared orbital. Um, and so without even like thinking too much about straining your brain about, about the symmetry of the orbitals involved, you just think about what uh, um, what orbitals would interact nicely with these, then, then I think that's a good a good starting point. Okay, so I, I realize we're almost out of time. Let me just draw this out and then and then we'll 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 um, uh, call it here and then and then we'll finish the last two problems today at the start of the next class. Um, I have this issue where I have two different times on my iPad and then at real life time. So I, 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 um, I've got to get this sorted out. Um, so let's consider uh, an example that, that is uh, uh, a titanium three plus aqua complex, um, which titanium is, is a D4 metal. It's in its plus three oxidation state. So it's D1. Here are the, 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 um, uh, the, the uh, D, S, and, and P orbitals that can participate in, in bonding in this, in this MO treatment. And here are the symmetry adapted linear combinations of the ligand um, orbitals, and they are of the symmetry that I defined um, previously. So in terms of the um, combining these, now we can have Th those combinations that I just mentioned. Um, uh, 
but you notice that two, two orbital, uh, th three orbitals that I didn't mention were the D X Y D Y Z and D X Z. Sorry if I said any of those twice. So those aren't going to participate in any bonding with the um, ligands. And then the EG will have a, a bonding component and an anti-bonding component. I would just draw this somewhat quickly in the interest of time. And now I think the point I wanted to make here, and then you have is that if, if one focuses only on the frontier orbitals. It actually is is the same, not exactly the same, but the first approximation ends up being the same. Ugh, that's terrible looking. As the picture that we get from crystal field theory, where we have an octahedral metal complex, um, we're, we're not counting all of the um, uh, uh, bonding orbitals and we're just paying attention to the D orbitals, which are predominantly metal and predom predominantly metal based and predominantly non-bonding in character. Um, and so through this MO treatment, you end up getting a frontier orbital diagram that, that looks similar to what you would, you would get from crystal field theory. And then just to, to come back to one point that I made very quickly, just thinking about kind of the symmetry of the orbitals involved and whether they become bonding or non-bonding, the dz squared and the dxy, dx squared minus y squared become bonding orbitals because they can interact nicely with these salcs of EG symmetry, whereas the other three d orbitals become non-bonding in character. Okay, so I think I'll, that, that's where I will leave things for today. And then, as I said, we'll resume with uh, the last two problems of the day and a, a discussion of, um, of, of bonding that's a little bit more simplified than, than, than this, just really focusing more on that MO diagrams of the ligands that are in, involved in, in bonding and, and sort of a simplified representation of the D orbitals. Um, but I wanted to give this full-blown um, presentation first so that, that then like the simplified representation hopefully makes makes some sense or at least you see where that's coming from okay signing off here anything from the tas i'm forgetting all good okay have a good rest of your day everybody